Philippians chapter 2. As I mentioned, I referred to this passage a couple of weeks ago as we were concluding our series on the Ten Commandments. And, um, and this is just one of those passages that, for whatever reason, may not seem like a Christmas passage, but in a very real way, it is a dynamic Christmas passage because it not only tells us that God came, but it also tells us how God came in the person of Jesus. And so I want to read Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5 and reading down through verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I told this story uh, a number of years ago. It kind of goes hand in hand with my uh, leaving high school early to put it mildly. Uh, My brother at the time, my oldest brother, Stefan, owned a surf shop, Island Water Sports, out in Coral Springs. Because he's such an astute businessman, it lasted about three years. Um, And I worked for him, okay? (laughs) I worked for him. He has a microphone on a regular basis, and I have a microphone on a regular basis, and it never ceases to amaze me that every time we bring each other up, anytime we have a microphone, we try to tear each other down. So that was my little shot at him. Um, Anyway, and we're very close. Um, But uh, he had a surf shop, and I worked there after school. Uh, And so I would go to school during the day, and then I would go over to the surf shop to work after school. And uh, this was during my junior year of high school, and I was literally skipping school for weeks at a time, entire days. So my dad would drop me off at school, and I would get there about 10 minutes early, and I would uh, go find someone, a friend of mine who had a car, and I would recruit that person to skip school with me on that particular day. And before the bell rang, before the first bell rang, we were already out the door. And I was doing this literally, okay, I am not kidding, literally for weeks on end. And then I would show up at my brother's surf shop after school as if I had gone to school the entire day and uh, thought I was getting away with it. Well, one day as I was working after school at my brother's store, uh, my dad pulled up. And it was about 3.30 in the afternoon, and I knew that my dad worked till about 5.30 or 6. He was a psychologist in town, and usually his last patient was around 4.30 or 5, and he would get home about 5.30 or 6. And so I thought this was kind of strange that he was pulling up to my brother's store uh, at 3.30 in the afternoon. And something inside of me when I saw him pull up in his car, something inside of me went, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, this is not good news. This is not, why would my dad be here? I was already feeling somewhat paranoid because I was doing so much bad things and I I was afraid that I was gonna get caught. I lived in this perpetual state of paranoia and so when my dad pulled up, I thought to myself, I'm caught. Um, It was seeing my dad pull up, and he did, by the way, pull up because he was there to confront me um, and tell me that he knew he had discovered earlier that day that I had been skipping school for weeks, and he also had discovered the kinds of things I was doing while I was skipping school, and um, he was there to basically bring me home and lock me in my room for the next four or five years. Um, But... The, int- the reason I bring that up is because I'll never forget the way I felt when I saw him pull up, ever. I was not only remarkably frightened, 
I was scared to death because I, I knew that I had been caught, but there was also something very freeing about his arrival. It was frightening because I knew I was in trouble. There was no getting out of this one on my own, but it was freeing because I knew that my dad loved me and was going to set things straight and make things right. I knew it. You see, anytime, uh, and you heard Joel's testimony a few minutes ago on the screen, but anytime you're living in a state of slavery and you're feeling scared, and, and what's, what's enslaving about living that way, the way I was living at the time, is that you, you live in fear, you live in a perpetual state of, oh, I hope I don't get caught. You have to be sneaky and all of those things, and that begins to weigh you down and make life heavy, and it makes you feel like you're wearing chains. And so even though I felt like I couldn't stop and I continued to do what I was doing, there was a part down deep inside of me that in a sense wanted to get caught because I knew that I was in trouble and I wanted someone outside of me to save me. And so even though his arrival that day was very frightening, I knew I was caught, I knew I was in trouble, I knew that the hammer was going to come down hard, there was also something remarkably freeing about it because I knew my dad. I knew that he loved me, I knew that he wanted what was best for me, and I knew that he could set things straight and make things right. Well, this passage reminds me of that day. For some strange reason... (laughs) This passage reminds me of that day because in the same way that my dad's arrival was both bad and good news for me, the arrival of God is both bad and good news for us. It's both frightening in a sense and freeing because you know when the head honcho himself shows up, things are bad, okay? I mean, when, when the main man arrives on the scene, you know things are bad, He's not delegating this one to someone smaller. You know when the main man shows up on the scene, things are really, really bad. So in this sense, it's frightening. But it's also good news when the main man comes because it signals that things are going to get set right. And so we learn basically here in this passage, we learn two things. We learn that God came and his arrival is frightening But because of what he came to do, his arrival is remarkably freeing as well. So we learn really first that God came. I I think sometimes that we fail to be swept off of our feet by the fact that God came. I just, I think sometimes we, especially if you grew up in church, especially if you grew up hearing the Christmas story and those sorts of things, I think it sort of starts to become white noise. We like singing the songs and we certainly like Christmas Eve worship services and we like the feel and the festivity of it all, but I think sometimes our hearts fail to be gripped and grasped by the very fact that God came. See, we really don't think things are that bad. However bad things may be, they're certainly not too big for us to handle. I love the story of Muhammad Ali who was flying on a commercial plane one time and they were experiencing some turbulence. And so the pilot comes over the loudspeaker and says, would all passengers please fasten their seatbelt? And so Muhammad Ali, of course, did not fasten his seatbelt, and one of the uh, flight attendants noticed that he had not fastened his seatbelt, and so she approached him and said, sir, would you please fasten your seatbelt? And he looked at her in a very brash, typical Muhammad Ali way and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And he, she bounced back immediately and said, well, Superman don't need no airplane either, so fasten your seatbelt. I think sometimes um, we fail to be swept off of our feet by the very fact that God came because we really don't think things are that bad. We really don't think we are that bad. And even though things may be somewhat troublesome sometimes and we may experience some turbulence in our lives for whatever reason, because of our own fault or the fault of someone else, uh, we, we think we're big enough to handle it. Things are not so bad that we can't handle things on our own. God coming himself, is that not a divine overreaction to things? 
I mean, are things that bad that God himself has to come? Couldn't he just give us some on-high instructions on how to right the ship? I mean, aren't we capable enough of hearing his instruction and putting that instruction into practice? Did God himself really, really have to come? Are things really that desperate? Are we really that desperate? You know, the only people who lack desperation are the ones who don't really know themselves very well. The only people who lack a sense of desperation are people who don't really know themselves very well because believe it or not, and I know this is counterintuitive, but listen to me, believe it or not, our biggest problem is not our badness, it's our so-called goodness. That's our biggest problem. Okay, now I'm going to say here in a few minutes that goodness is a good thing, it's a great thing. It's when we start believing that we're good that it becomes a bad thing. Our biggest problem, your biggest problem, is not your badness. Your biggest problem, my biggest problem, is our so-called goodness because the great and merciful surprise, listen to me, is that we come to God not by doing it right but by doing it wrong. We get that backwards. The great and merciful surprise is that we come to God not by doing it right, but by doing it wrong. Joel gave a remarkable testimony on screen about that very thing a few minutes ago, and I'm sure it's true for all of us. If you're anything like me, the moments when I have felt closest to God are the moments when I've needed Him the most because I've blown it in some way. The moments when I have felt God's presence the most It's not that I don't sense and feel and know God's presence in a lot of different ways and in a lot of different places. I do. But C.S. Lewis, I think, got it right when he said that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pains. In other words, we hear God, we see God, we come to know God in deeper, bright, big, and beautiful ways when we're at the bottom. Not when we've just accomplished something great, but when we are flat on our back at the bottom. The great and merciful surprise is that we come to God not by doing it right, but by doing it wrong. It's not that goodness, as I said, is a bad thing. It's a great thing. The problem is when we start believing that we're good, we forget that even the good things we do are mixed with bad motives at the very least, which is why Martin Luther said we not only need to be saved from our bad works, but our damnable good ones too. Those are the ones that we think we're doing and we're making it and we're cutting it and it's, it's our perceived goodness that keeps us from feeling desperate. We've concluded that a good person is one who does the right things and avoids the wrong things, and a bad person is one who does the wrong things and avoids the right things, but the coming of God demonstrates that our situation is a little bit worse than that. Just a little bit worse than that. That God demands an inner goodness as we saw last week as we finished our series on the Ten Commandments, that God demands an inner goodness and purity that we cannot achieve. And that was Jesus' main point in Matthew chapter 5. In the Sermon on the Mount, he cuts through the outer behavior of a person and looks at what's in the heart. And Jesus insisted there that goodness is not simply a matter of what we do or don't do, but rather a question of why we do it or don't do it. Which is why the desperate addict is closer to the heart of grace than the devout moralist. Okay, that's why. That's why the people that I know who are in love with Jesus the most are the people who feel most desperate, the people who feel their desperation the most. I told you this story if you were here. I told you the story about a year ago. I was at a conference, and I I spoke at a conference in Dallas, and Um, And after I was finished speaking, there was a panel discussion with me and the other conference speakers, and and there was about seven of us on the platform, 
uh, sitting at a long table and we each had microphones, sort of table microphones in front of us and we were taking questions from the large group of uh, predominantly college students that were in front of us and one of them asked, in fact I think this was the first question, uh, what, what do we do if we're not as de- or how can we know the love of God if we're not as desperate as the kind of person that Tullian described in his talk? And uh, I know this comes as a big surprise to you, but uh, before anyone else could answer, I grabbed the microphone and I said, uh, keep looking. Really, keep looking. If, If you're not going through anything really bad, if your health is relatively stable, if your relationships are going pretty well, if you've got a decent job and you can pay the bills, and you're not experiencing any kind of crisis externally or internally, it's very, very easy for you to conclude that you're not desperate, but keep looking. God's law is for the purpose of exposing us and showing us that we are far worse than we think we are. So if you don't think you're desperate, it's because you're not taking God's law seriously enough. You've cheapened it. You've lowered the bar. You think that, you know, you think be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect gets dumbed down to just try your best. Have your devotions. Spend some time with the Lord. Okay, pray, get out your prayer list. We, we, have these, we have these things that we do that we can check off and think that if we've checked them off that we're actually pulling it off. And so I just said, keep looking. Trust me, trust me. If you really examine yourself honestly and if you really look down deep under the surface at your heart and what makes you tick and what you're afraid of and the kinds of things that you pursue and why you pursue those things, I think you'll discover that you're far more desperate than you realize. Um, I mean, this is, this is why the desperate addict is closer to the heart of grace than the devout moralist. Our badness is not our greatest problem. Our perceived goodness is our greatest problem. And this is also why in the Bible, the prostitute always gets the gospel while the Pharisee doesn't. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? The rebellious, broken down younger brother gets it. The moralistic, I do everything right older brother doesn't. He doesn't. In fact, what's ironic is that in both the case of the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son and the Pharisees, every time Jesus would promiscuously distribute grace to bad people, they got furious. They were just, they were furious. They don't deserve it. That's the point. That's the point. We deserve it. Good people or people who think they're good just don't don't feel their desperation, and so they're not, they're not swept off of their feet by the very fact that God came. The reason we resist the notion of radical grace is because every natural instinct cries out against the reality of personal powerlessness. Every natural instinct, ever since Genesis chapter 3, Every natural instinct cries out against the very real reality of personal powerlessness. We think we can do it, we think we can make it. So let me just ask you some diagnostic questions that I asked myself yesterday, just to help me feel my own powerlessness, my own desperation. Where is my life unmanageable? In what areas is my life unmanageable? Where am I not in control? And how do I feel about the fact that I'm not in control? That might be in the context of your marriage or with your children and the decisions that they're making or whatever the case may be. Some addiction that you may have that you don't like because it keeps you enslaved but you just keep going back. Where, where is my life unmanageable? What things am I afraid of? What makes me afraid? Death, uh, a broken relationship, fear of the unknown, um, not having the kind of financial security that you think you need, 
Uh, I mean, where, what things am I afraid of? Am I angry at anyone? Am I angry at anyone? What makes me angry? Not just am I angry, but what is it specifically that makes me angry? Why am I angry at this person? Or why am I angry at these people? And if it's because they've done you wrong, why has them doing you wrong made you so angry and enslaved you in bitterness? What makes me angry? What, what makes me anxious? What makes me anxious? Do I have tendencies that get in the way of my relationships with others? In what ways do I try to justify these tendencies? I mean, these are all just sort of off-the-cuff questions that at least yesterday helped me feel that I'm worse than I think I am, which is something I need to go back to all the time, all the time, because we are so naturally prone to believe our own press. We so desperately need to feel good about ourselves in order to feel like we matter that we have to create sort of this um, positive, uppity narrative for our lives whereby we convince ourselves that we're actually better than we are. And we start believing that. And so that doesn't, that's not something that we have to be taught. That's just something that comes naturally to us. And so we, we have to regularly go back asking questions like these so that we can feel our desperation so that we can once again be swept off of our feet by our deliverer. Because the fact of the matter is until we see how bad we are, we'll never see how good God is, ever. And we'll never be swept off of our feet by the fact that the God of the universe, the God of the universe who spoke all things into existence, took on human flesh and came to us, not because we were doing it right, but because we were doing it wrong. I said something last night uh, via Twitter that uh, got quite a reaction in both directions, a positive reaction and a negative reaction. I simply said, uh, that Christianity is not first, Jesus is our example. Christianity is first, Jesus is our substitute. Well, of course, I got, you know, lambasted by people. Well, that's a false dichotomy, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's both our substitute and our example. And I, I get it, okay? There's only so much you can nuance in 140 characters on Twitter, okay? It's amazing how people can evaluate your entire theological grid by one tweet. It's ridiculous. However, um, the fact of the matter is Christianity, the foundation, the anchor of the Christian faith, the focus of the Christian faith is not Jesus is our example, what would Jesus do? The foundation and the focus, the anchor of the Christian faith is Jesus is our substitute. What has Jesus done on behalf of people like you and me who could not do what God required? That's the focus of the, that's the focus of the Christian faith, that's the foundation of the Christian faith, and until we see that, if we believe that the focus of the Christian faith is, well, Jesus is our example, well, Jesus being our example is not good news to us, okay? It's not, because he turned the other cheek. He got beaten and didn't retaliate. Someone cuts me off in traffic, I want them to die, okay? Jesus being my example is not good news to me. Jesus being my example just shows me how bad I am. The perfect example of Christ showcases my imperfection. Well, if that's the foundation of the Christian faith, I am exiting stage right because I can't pull it off. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus is our substitute so that when God looks at a scoundrel like me who wants to kill the person who cut me off in traffic, what he sees because of Jesus is someone who turns the other cheek. I mean, that's good news, okay? That is, that's good news. Um, and until we see how bad we really are, we'll never see how good God is. As long as we think that Christianity is all about us just following Jesus' example, which implies that we can follow Jesus' example, we can do everything that Jesus did. Some people, I'll, let me get theological here for a second, um, technically theological, everything we do is theological, but technically theologically, technically theological. Um, 
Some people uh, try to elevate the ability of the Christian by pointing to a doctrine called union with Christ, that we are united to Christ, that we are, as Paul says in Ephesians, we are chosen in Christ, we are redeemed in Christ, we are set free in Christ, and our union with Christ is what gives us the power to do everything Jesus did. But let me tell you something, union with Christ does not mean we can now do everything Jesus did. Union with Christ means that we now freely receive everything that Jesus earned, there's a, difference, there's a difference there. It's called imputation, okay? The doctrine of imputation, that we receive everything Jesus earned so that when God the Father looks at us, he sees the performance of Jesus, not our pathetic performance. And that's what gives us access to God. That's what, that's what sets our feet before God and enables us to stand before God and all of those things. So until we see how bad we are, we'll never see how good God is. And what this passage tells us is that sinners are loved by a God who infallibly bends toward us even while we perpetually bend away from him. That we, listen, we sinners are loved by a God who infallibly bends toward us even while we perpetually bend away from him. So it tells us that, you know, Jesus came, God came, God came down, he descended, and he, he took on human flesh and frailty, and he fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law, all of God's demands on our behalf. And then he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Well, why did he have to die? I mean, here's the God of the universe infallibly bending toward us, coming down. Why? Because we are perpetually bending away from him perpetually bending away from him. But just as shocking as the fact that God came is how he came. I mean, the way God came shows us just how upside down and counterintuitive God's economy really is. When my dad showed up that day, his presence was commanding. Nice car, nice suit, the whole deal. You know, he got out of the car and I was like, okay, the king has arrived, I'm in trouble. Um, but God came onto the crime scene very, very differently. Very, very differently. He didn't come on a bolt of lightning flexing his muscles. He came in weakness, not strength. He came to die, not to kill. He came to give, not to take. He came to serve rather than be served. God became flesh. He moved into our mess. He came into the real world. As light, he came into our darkness, he came into our sin and our sadness, our faults and our fakeness, our fears and our failures, our dysfunction and our disappointments. That's what he came into. It's not just that he came, but how he came, where he came. He came into the real world of poverty and hunger and sex addiction and alcoholism and broken families and human trafficking and natural disasters and so on and so forth. He came into the world of guilt and shame and stress and anxiety and rebellious teenagers and depression and job loss and relational tension and unmet expectations. That's the world that he came into. He came into your world. He came into my world. And not only did he come to bear the burden of the mess that we made, he came into a world that didn't want him. So John 1 tells us that he came to his own even though his own did not receive him, that despite all of its failings, the world still wanted to be on its own. That's what it tells us. He, he didn't come because we were crying out for help. He came because we were running from him in rebellion. While we were yet sinners, Paul tells us, Christ died for us. God came God came not because we were crying out for him, but because we were running from him. He came not because we were all right, but because we were all wrong. Not because we were clean, but because we were dirty. That's why he came. He meets our mess 
with his mercy, the arrival of God's rescuer confronts our presumption that we can make it on our own, that we are in fact Superman. The arrival of Jesus on the scene is the same as the flight attendant to Muhammad Ali. Well, Superman don't need no airplane either. You're not as strong as you think you are. You're not as big, you're not as in control as you think you are. Jesus did not come to give us a self-help plan or a blueprint for better living. He came to save us from our self-help plans and blueprints for better living. I'm gonna say that again because what I just said, okay, is just about the exact opposite of what I grew up hearing regarding the Christian faith, regarding what Christianity was all about. And whether it was explicitly stated or just implied, that's what I picked up on. That Jesus didn't come to give us a self-help plan or a blueprint for better living. He came to save us from our self-help plans. It's our self-help plans that got us into this mess. It was Adam and Eve's self-help plan that got us into this mess. We can do this on our own. God is my co-pilot, okay? Do your best, God will do the rest. You know, I mean, all of these slogans, all of these things that, at least in my case, I grew up hearing, believing that, you know, God was telling me to meet him halfway. You just, listen, even if you can just make your way 80 yards down the field, I'll take you into the end zone. Okay, I'll do the remaining 20 yards or vice versa. You know, you, you are capable of making it 90 yards down the field or God will take you 90 yards down the field, but you've got to, you've got to run in the last 10. Okay, I've got football on my mind today because the Cowboys play the Eagles at 8.30 tonight and I'm telling you right now, okay, um, I better stop. <laughs> I, <laughs> This is big, guys, this is huge, okay? Uh, the Cowboy-Eagles game is what I'm talking about, is big, it's huge. I don't think you understand how big this is, it's huge. Um, it's really big. Uh, if the Cowboys lose tonight, <laughs> just kidding, okay. <laughs> if the Cowboys lose tonight, I fire Rob Pacienza tomorrow morning, <laughs> period. And then any other God-forsaken Philadelphia Eagles fans in this room will be banned, excommunicated. Uh, <laughs> you know, the last time the Eagles played the Cowboys Thanksgiving Day and the Eagles trounced the Cowboys, Rob and I didn't talk for four days. My right-hand man, like my best friend, didn't talk for four days. We give each other space out of mutual respect for one another and our pain. Um, but let me just say it again. He did, Jesus did not come. God did not come in the person of Jesus to deliver a self-help plan. He came to save us from that stuff, from the burdensome demand that we feel to rescue ourselves and to free ourselves. Jesus, who possessed everything, became nothing so that we who had nothing could possess everything. That's the, that is the gospel and the good news of this particular season. So God is not the God of second chances. You've heard me say this before. He's not the God of second chances. That may be something else you've heard before, that God is the God of second chances. He's not. A God of, a God of second chances brings me no relief at all, <laughs> okay, because I'm going to blow it again. He could be the God of a thousand chances. I'm never gonna get it right. So God is not the God of second chances. He's something so much better than the God of second chances. He's the God of one chance and a second Adam. It's a big difference between those. He's not saying do more, try harder. He's saying done. It is finished. Now you're free, you're free to love, and you're free to laugh, and you're free to serve because everything you need in Christ you already possess. I've already delivered the goods into your bank account. You have more money there than you can spend, so enjoy, 
Enjoy your relationships without trying to fix everybody. You don't need to fix people to make yourself feel better. Enjoy the work that you do. Enjoy the vocation that I've given you. Not because now you don't need to succeed in your work in order to justify your existence. You're free to give yourself to it without needing anything from it in return. All of these things. That's, that's the good news of the gospel. He did not come to give us a second chance. He's the God of one chance. We blew it. And he's the God of a second Adam who fulfilled all of his holy conditions so that our relationship to him could be wholly unconditional. You see, the first Adam ventured up into the realm of things above and brought death. The second Adam ventured down into the realm of things below and brought life. The essence of sin, as John Stott put it one time, The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. And the good news of this passage is that God comes to us not because we've done it right, but because we've done it wrong. That the God of the universe who spoke all things into existence is a bottom feeder. Which means God doesn't stand at the top of a ladder and shout down, you can do it. He hangs on a cross at the bottom and says, it is finished.